Good afternoon from Switzerland. Good morning and good evening to participants worldwide. And welcome to this webinar on fragility fractures in Sub-Saharan Africa, the known and the un unknown. My name is Dominique Pierron. I'm the science manager at IOF. Before introducing the chairperson of this webinar, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing your questions in the question box of the control panel. The questions will be voiced to the speakers towards the end of this webinar. This being said, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Ngozi Ngeze, who is going to chair this webinar. Dr. Ngeze is a consultant radiologist at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, Enugu, and the former head of the radiology department at the same hospital. She's also the founder of the first osteoporosis foundation in Nigeria, a society member of our IOF Committee of National Societies. She is the founder and the chief medical uh, director of the Triska Clinics, and a dedicated and uh, mentor for medical students and residents at the University of Nigeria Med Medical School for over 25 years. Dr. Ngezi, welcome, and the mic is yours. Ah, you are muted. Thank you very much, Dominique. I am. Um happy to chair this webinar and I uh, have two brilliant speakers today. They're going to tell us all about fragility fractures in sub-Saharan Africa, what we know and what we don't know. We have here Professor Kate Ward and Dr. Celia Gregson. Professor Kate Ward is a professor of Global Musculoskeletal Health at MRC Life Course Epidemiology. She is a director of NIHR Southampton Global Nutrition Research Group. Her research interests are on nutrition status and lifestyle impact on adolescent growth and aging. And this is to ensure healthy musculoskeletal system. The second speaker, another brilliant lady, Dr. Celia Gregson, is a consultant senior lecturer and epidemiologist at Musculoskeletal Research Unit, University of Bristol, and an honorary consultant of the geriatrician at the Royal United Hospital in Bath. Doctor, I think we have lost uh, the last sentence of Dr. Ngeze, but uh, Dr. Gregson, we are happy to listen to your talk. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you to the International Institute Process Foundation for the invitation to speak. Both Kate and I are delighted. Um, and we've tasked ourselves with the discussion of the known and the unknowns in terms of fragility fractures in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, uh, I have no particular conflicts of interest and these are my disclosures. So if we look at uh, data from the United Nations in terms of project projections for population growth by the different regions across the world over the course of the remainder of this century, it is sub-Saharan Africa that is predicted to see the greatest population growth in terms of absolute numbers of people. We've seen up until 2020 that Southeast Asia has seen the, the greatest sort of so-called population boom, but it's predicted by around 2060 that uh, growth in terms of population in, in, in the Asian countries will be surpassed by that of sub-Saharan Africa. And if uh, we just contrast uh, the projections for Europe and North America, which are projected to remain pretty static, you can see by contrast um, what is projected to, to be likely to occur in terms of population growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
if we if we look um, particularly uh, by groups uh, based on age across the whole population of the world, um, certainly the greatest number of people live uh, or, or are aged between 25 um, and 64. And that will continue to be the case or is projected to continue to be the case. But what we um, are expecting to see post 2020 is this gradual increase in the proportion of the world's population who is aged over 65. When we look then uh, by age and by region, I'm showing you two graphs here, one for Sub-Saharan Africa, the other for Europe and North America. By the end of this century, it is anticipated that approximately 13% of all the people aged 65 plus in the world will be living in Sub-Saharan Africa. So looking at the first graph on the, on the left, where you see it in sort of uh, violety color for Sub-Saharan Africa, certainly the greatest um, uh, growth in terms of numbers of people will occur in those people aged under 25. We've already seen that and that is projected to continue. But really from um, in the next uh, decade really we're expecting to see this substantial uplift beginning in terms of the numbers um, of those aged 65 plus in the region. And if we compare that to patterns uh, in Europe and North America, we can see that actually since the 1970s, the, the, the number of people aged under 25 has been slowly declining. In contrast, um, uh, since the 1950s, the population aged 65 plus has been increasing and will continue to increase until around 1960, it's predicted, where that will start to plateau. Now, you'll have noticed that the y-axes are not the same on these two graphs, and if we actually uh, squish them down to be or, or stretch them out to be comparable. You can see that um, within the next 50 or so years, there are projected to be more people age 65 plus uh, who are going to be living in sub-Saharan Africa uh, than the whole of Europe and North America. Now, if we look at that population growth or that projected population growth on the y-axis of this graph, um, and compare that against the gross national income per capita within a given country. You can see that those countries, each country indicated by a circle, those countries with the greatest projected population growth in older people are the same countries that actually have the lowest gross, gross national income per capita based on UN and World Bank projections. What that means is, um, and, and the other point to make is many of these circles are red and that means many of those countries are in Africa. And what that means is that certain countries which are expected to see the greatest um, rise in older populations have the least financial resource potentially to pay for the healthcare demands of those older populations. So the WHO have, have stated that this current decade is the decade of healthy aging. What do they mean by healthy aging? They mean that it's the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being in older age. So key to functional ability is functional musculoskeletal ability. And we know that musculoskeletal health is broadly a composite of joint, bone and muscle health. And there are common diseases that occur when one has impairment in that musculoskeletal health. So arthritis, back pain, fractures, osteoporosis, falls, frailty, they're all very common and, and well known to us. And so when one loses functional musculoskeletal ability, that manifests as immobility, disability, pain, and importantly for low income countries, productivity loss. So how much of a problem is disability currently in the region? Well, here are data from the Global Burden of Disease study from four years ago, and they show the rates of years lived with disability uh, on the y-axis by age groups on the x-axis. And in this sort of mid purple color is the proportion of disability attributable to musculoskeletal disorders. And you can see that by the age of 15, there is already emerging disability uh, in that age group attributable, attributable to musculoskeletal disease. And that becomes very apparent by the age of 50 and in populations who are older than that after that. So, so disability because of musculoskeletal ill health is already a reality in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I wanted to take a life course model and reflect on the functional capacity or this functional ability that is key to the WHO definition.
And so this is a sort of hypothesis of how um, functional capacity um, relates to age in high income settings. So we know that as we um, grow through adolescence, we gain functional capacity. Um, and we grow until we uh, achieve our maximal functional capacity around our early 20s. And then generally we live in a sort of steady, healthy adult state, state on average until we begin to age and we progressively lose functional capacity as we get older until at some point we die. And should we experience an acute challenge to health, and I can give an example of a fracture, we will have an acute period of disability where we lose functional capacity but then we access healthcare, we access physiotherapy, and we regain the position on the trajectory than we would, that we would have been on had we not had that injury. If you contrast that with a hypothesized model in a low income setting, you see that um, it is thought that adolescents accrue that functional capacity at a slower rate. They achieve maximal functional capacity later in the life course. And they don't have necessarily have this period of stability uh, for the years that is seen in high income settings. One tends to start to lose functional capacity earlier in the life course, perhaps with a steeper trajectory of loss so that one dies at a younger age than in a high income setting. And then should you see um, that population experience acute challenge to health, such as a fracture, there's a marked loss in functional capacity, so a marked increase in disability. And because the healthcare service isn't necessarily there to help somebody get back to the trajectory that they would have otherwise been on, the trajectory of their uh, functional capacity remains altered for the remainder of their life course uh, and, uh, and may well lead to a premature death. Now, how does that model map to what we know about bone? Well, we know what happens to bone mass. This will be a very familiar diagram to many of you. So we know that bone grows and we accrue bone mass through adolescence until we achieve peak bone mass in our early 20s. Men have a higher peak bone mass than women. And then women, as they transition through the menopause, will have a relatively rapid loss of bone and then things settle down and men and women continue to lose bone slowly as we get older. And at some point, we reach a, a sort of theoretical window of fracture risk where we've lost bone and we are at risk of sustaining a fracture should we have a, a relatively um, minor uh, injury. And you can imagine that in a, a, an environment where there are a lot of environmental challenges or health challenges, so um, malnutrition, a life lived with HIV, antiretroviral therapies for HIV, recurrent infections, tuberculosis, all of those things may mean that one doesn't achieve the peak bone mass that genetically one has the ability to achieve. And therefore that peak bone mass is compromised. And then when you're going into um, adulthood, you have less of a reserve to draw upon before you lose sufficient bone mass to be at risk of fracture. And we know that a 10% increase in peak bone mass, so that's about one standard deviation, will predict a 50% reduction in fracture risk later in female life. The corollary of that, of course, is that a 10% reduction in peak bone mass predicts a doubling in fracture risk later in life. And so a group of us were um, of a similar mindset and concern around this. And so back in 2018, um, we so really just a, a group of um, interested researchers across a, a range of different um, institutions in, in the region established SAMHSA. So this is the Sub-Saharan African Musculoskeletal Network. And it aims to build sustainable capacity in musculoskeletal health research by creating a collaborative platform um, for people to talk and to share their learning, with the idea being that, that that joint learning can inform health policy, that we as a collaborative can promote training opportunities and knowledge transfer and, and ideally public engagement. And the other thing that we were quite keen to do was to provide guidance to standardize the methods for musculoskeletal assessment across the region, because as you'll know, PQCT grip strength, they can be measured in many different ways. It's really helpful if everybody's following the same SOPs, because then one can do between country comparisons and pool data. Um, to maximize utility of data collected. So um, a number of, of, of countries, uh, we've got representation in a number of countries within Africa now, and then you can see a handful of UK institutions who are part of this collaborative. Um, and we're very much open to um, new um, African partners because it's very much just still at the beginning, this network of what we hope to achieve. <laughs> 
Um, and at this point, I'm going to um, hand over to Kate, who's going to talk more specifically about the data in terms of BMD and fracture. And then after she's spoken, I'm going to come back and present um, a study that both Kate and I are quite involved with um, and, and what we're hoping to achieve through that. So I'll stop at this stage. Thank you. Thanks, Celia, and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak to you all today. And so my task is to take forward um, Celia's introduction and just to review some of the research that we and others have been doing over recent years in some of our partner African countries. I have no major disclosures. So if we start at the beginning, really for many, many years, there'd been a, a concept, a, a very common concept that hip fracture incidence is low in Africa. And there were very, very few data until recently. These data on the left-hand side from Cyrus Cooper show the projected number of osteoporotic fractures worldwide back in 1992. And there the concern was, was that there was going to be at least a doubling of rates in low and middle income countries over the coming decades. As Celia has outlined, the growing ageing population in, in sub-Saharan Africa is of concern because we expect those fragility fractures to start to increase. And moving forwards to 2014, there was a very nice um, review by Jane Corley and her um, colleagues where she summarised the global burden of hip fracture incidents over over the globe and at that time the data available for South Africa and Nigeria which you can see highlighted in this teal circle at the bottom of the screen showed how very low in comparison to other countries such as the um, Scandinavian countries here and the UK and France down here that hip fracture incidence per 100,000 person years was extremely low. But what other evidence do we have? There have been studies um, in Nigeria, um, the Gambia in our own group many years ago in 1996 reported some fractures, um, but again, very, very few. And so until recently, the studies have been relatively small, focused on one or two hospitals um, and not um, focusing entirely on osteoporotic fracture um, per se. Back in the 1960s, Solomon et al, in one of the seminal studies from South Africa, did look at hip fracture incidents um, in black men and women from Johannesburg, and I'll come back to that shortly. And then more recently in South Africa, Conradi has looked at vertebral fracture um, prevalence. And then most recently, uh, Sapna Della and team in KwaZulu-Natal have looked at the national hip fracture incidence. And that's what I'm going to describe to you in the first part of my talk today. So to come to that study, South Africa, as we all know, is a multi-ethnic population of over 50 million people. The predominant ethnicity is African um, ethnicity, and then we have coloured white and Indian populations as well. This study was centred around three main regions, Hauteng Province, um, Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. And it was a prospective observational study in 94 hospitals. 69 of those were in the private sector and 25 public. Subjects were recruited if they were aged over 40 years and above with a fragility fracture of the hip, the neck of femur or the trochanter. In total, 2,767 subjects were enrolled and importantly, 66% of those were in the public sector. And so what, was, what did they find? Well, you can see from the panels on the right hand side, the classical shape of hip fracture incidence rising as we go across the ages. On the left hand side are males and on the right hand side are females. And each of the different colored bars um, represents a different ethnicity. As again, as we'd expect in, and we've seen in other countries, hip fracture incidence was higher in women than in men. But importantly, at lower ages, so the under 60 year olds, men actually had a higher hip fracture incidence. The incidence rate, for example, in South African white populations was 129.9 per 100,000. And comparing that to the UK and the Netherlands, it was about 50, you know, half, the, half the incidence rate, but much greater than we saw on that initial graph that I showed you from that systematic review of Jane Corley. Uh, the incidence rate in Africans was 43.6 per 100,000 in women and 31.1 in the men. <laughs> 
but despite the lowest rate of fractures, Africans actually had the second highest number of fractures in absolute terms. And if we compare those numbers of 43.6 and 31.1 to those reported by Solomon um, nearly 60 years ago, we can see how the hip fractures have predictably risen over recent decades. And also, interestingly, I think the rates in Indian population were similar to those that we'd observe in North India um, and lower than Singapore and Indian. And so this, this work by Della et al. just shows, represents a really comprehensive study of hip fracture incidents and the importance of us starting to take notice of this issue across the region. If we go back to the figure of Corley et al, what I've done here is with the vertical green lines, you can see I've projected on the results of the Della study. In women, the incidence rate ranged from 176 per 100,000 to 43.6 in the African population. And now it's much more comparable to China, India, um, Indonesia. Um, and then in the men, similarly, the incidence rates range um, between 66.5 per 100,000 to 31.1 per 100,000. And again, with rates similar to those we'd see in Malaysia, Thailand, um, Oman, for example. And so those data present a real step forward in terms of what we know and how we can start to approach this um, clinically. In the same study, Fahana Peruk from the University of KwaZulu-Natal um, looked at the 30-day and one-year mortality in a subset of those patients. She recruited 200 patients, a mean age of 74.3, and 72% of those were female. She found 30-day mortality at 13%, and that, in contrast to the UK, for example, is 6.9%. Um, the 30-day mortality was similar between South Africa and the UK, where it's around 30%. Um, women had a higher um, incidence of mortality than men. Sorry, that's the other way around. Um, and then African patients were more likely to die than Indian patients at one year. The delays to surgery predicted death, um, as did elevated serum creatinine and um, CRP. And so again, this is the most comprehensive survey of patients across the region to date. And that's hip fracture incidence. What about vertebral fracture prevalence? We know vertebral fractures are the commonest form. And if we suffer from a vertebral fracture, it's more likely to suffer from a further fragility fracture. And we now have the tools and capacity in some of the countries to be able to look at vertebral fracture prevalence. And so these data I'm presenting here are from South Africa from the Conradi study, who reported a prevalence of 9.1% in African and 5.5% 5 5 in white females. Interestingly, about 60% of those vertebral fractures were classified as mild, and we know how difficult that classification is. Um, but in the same cohort, they also reported low trauma fractures in 18% of the African women and 11% in the white women. In my own work in the Gambia, we've been looking at a, a prospective study of musculoskeletal aging of 500 men and women aged over 40 years. In the Gambia, everybody is black African in our populations. And this time we only graded vertebral fractures of two or three, so moderate or severe and found a prevalence of 9%. Hip fractures by self-report were 3% in women and 0.4% in men. So again, starting to build up the evidence for um, and questioning the conception that, hip, that fractures don't occur in sub-Saharan Africa. And so to come back to the Gambian bone aging study in a bit more detail, I just want to show you three examples of the work we're doing there, where we're trying to understand whether the risk factors in the Gambia are similar to those that we'd see in high income countries and how they might present opportunities for preventative strategies through the life course. So GAMBAS is a, pr a prospective study of men and women age um, recruited in five-year age bands aged 40 to 75 years. They've had a whole suite of measurements. We're fortunate enough to have DEXA, where we can do lateral vertebral assessment, PQCT, um, various measures of functional ability, and take samples as well. 
and they've now had three sets of measurements. We've also inserted um, an urban pilot study in the Gambia. And just to orientate you, Gambia is in West Africa. Um, the population has an extremely low calcium intake um, and is predominantly, um, it's one of the poorest countries in the world and has, um, has until recently, we thought to have low fracture rates. We also in that population have studied the sarcopenia um, prevalence using the older definitions by the FNIH and the European Working Group. Um, and we found that FNIH appendicular lean mass actually in this population had the best sensitivity and specificity to predict poor muscle function. Um, it performed particularly well in, in women, in men less so. But using that, um, using that definition, we sh showed that 45% of women and 20% of men throughout the cohort would be diagnosed with sarcopenia. If we just look at over 60 year olds, it would be 68% of women and 81% of men. The European Working Group um, thresholds didn't perform as well, but we do need to go back and reassess all of this using the newer definitions. We also saw associations, as we would expect, between muscle force and the bone outcomes. But I think what this, this work really does, and a lot of the work that we've done in the Gambia does, it challenges the dogma that we need to really not apply definitions across diverse populations. So, so when we're developing definitions, we really need to look in a context-specific way. Thinking about the rising prevalence of aging of the aging population and concomitantly the non-communicable diseases, we've also looked at cardiac workload and whether that's related to bone health in our Gambian adults. So we studied we studied rate pressure product and pulse pressure product and looked at peripheral vascular calcification in our cohort and seen important sex differences in the associations between workload and aerial bone density. Interestingly, all the associations we found were in women, but not in men. So women with peripheral vascular calcification had a lower aerial density. And, and I think what this does is it really highlights that we know that there's a rising burden of non-communicable diseases that goes alongside the epidemiological and nutritional transition across all the populations in sub-Saharan Africa. And this may be another risk factor that we need to consider when thinking about bone health and, and looking for common preventative strategies. Finally, on GAMBAS, just to report about the, the magnitude of change, the primary outcome of GAMBAS was trying to characterise musculoskeletal ageing and see what happened as people aged in the population and, and did, for example, they lose less bone than we would expect um, in the UK or in other populations. What we found, this is, this is work by one of my postdocs, Michelo Brasil, and we found that advancing age was a main predictor of skeletal change in the population. And the magnitude was actually in keeping with that that we'd expect in higher income countries. In women, bone turnover markers were strongly associated with decreases in trabecular bone density and better muscle function was also associated with better bone health. And so finding strategies to maintain function and to maintain bone should have benefit for the ageing population. But just to change tack now and come back to the life course approach that Celia outlined earlier, this graph is a, a similar figure to the one she showed where we were where we we need to consider puberty and the attainment of peak bone mass and how as we go into aging and our aging populations increase, we can use preventative strategies to maximise that peak bone mass and hopefully prevent people becoming at higher fracture risk in later life. We know, again, as Celia said, that the timing of puberty is predictive of future fracture risk. And this study that I'm just describing in brief here was a study of calcium supplementation in children who were aged 8 to 11 years in the Gambia. What we found was that the age of peak velocity or puberty was actually impacted by the calcium supplementation. So immediately after the calcium supplementation, we show transient increases in bone mineral content after the supplementation, and they were sustained for quite a while. But in boys, what we actually saw was that puberty was consistently earlier in the calcium group compared to the placebo group, such that boys who'd taken the calcium were shorter at the end of growth 
In contrast, we showed no supplement effect on puberty in girls. So the conclusion to that study was that there wasn't a persisting effect of calcium supplementation on bone density in boys or girls who were accustomed to low dietary calcium intakes. But again, it does it does highlight the um, importance of considering populations and taking context-specific decisions about intervention at different stages of the life course. And if I just show you those data in contrast to South Africa adolescent data, this is, was a PhD student of mine who looked at the, in the blue and the yellow bars is, are the uh, Gambian children that I've just described to you and on the top are female and on the bottom panel are male. And the blue and the orangey bars are the birth to 20 cohort in South Africa. And what I just wanted to show you here was the difference in pubertal timing in the two populations, which I think highlights the, um, the transition of the populations in terms of development. I think it also highlights that in girls, there, there are very few differences between the black and the white girls in South Africa, but in boys, there's still an offset between the two groups in terms of timing of puberty. So again, thinking about when we might intervene or what we might want to do to have preventative strategies to increase peak bone mass and reduce fracture risk in later life. Just in the final part of my talk, I just wanted to show three studies um, that are looking at HIV. We can't, con we can't contextualize or consider bone health across um, sub-Saharan Africa without thinking about HIV and its impact. And these are three studies that have been actually staged at different points of the life course to show the impact of, of HIV and its treatment on bone development and bone maintenance in premenopausal women. The first, the first study aimed to compare bone density and bone size and bone strength in the cortical and trabecular bone of children in adolescents living with and without HIV in Harare in Zimbabwe. I don't have to go in time to go into all of the details about that, but what we've shown in the first cross-sectional analyses is that the, there are deficits in bone strength in boys and girls living with HIV compared to their um, non-HIV infected counterparts and that deficit gets greater with the great later stage of puberty suggesting that there's a, um, a continuing um, and, and greatening gap between the bone health of those individuals who are more uh, skeletally mature. There are deficits in the predicted bone strength of those children and the study, um, we're, we're actually currently following up the study and looking at longitudinal data to see whether those deficits attenuate with age. But this is an, an extremely important stage of the life course to consider. The second study looked at women who were um, antiretroviral treatment naive at recruitment, but had become pregnant when diagnosed with HIV. These data show consistent decreases as we'd expect with pregnancy and lactation. Um, and we see that across populations. And, and those consistent decreases were in both the women with HIV and without HIV. But in the women with HIV, total hip and whole body bone density did not return to the um, immediate lactation levels when women were non-pregnant and non-lactating. So you see a classic rebound of bone normally after, after children are weaned. So the accentuated bone loss was evident in women with HIV and only partial recovery in the hip and the whole body. So I think both of these studies showing that um, there may be um, implications for bone accrual, peak bone mass, and then through reproductive life, um, accruing deficits that we, we may need to take into consideration when thinking about preventing fractures in the populations. Finally, and just very briefly, HIV and its treatment, these are premenopausal women who weren't pregnant when we began to study them, but were initiated on ART after their initial bone density measurement. The black bars here are women who, without HIV, the darker grey in the middle are women with HIV but who 
weren't given antiretroviral therapy treatment. And then the women in the hatched bars are women with HIV who began ART um, treatment. And what you can clearly see is that from zero to 24 months, there's increasing bone loss in women at various sites across the skeleton. It seems that there's an initial loss and then a, a, then a plateauing at a steady state but again highlighting a risk factor that we may not take into account in, in different populations in terms of bone health and prevention of fractures. And so just finally, I've reviewed very rapidly thinking about the impact of rapid population aging on bone health in Sub-Saharan Africa, the impact that HIV prevalence through the life course might have on bone development and also bone maintenance through the midlife, potential multimorbidity risk factors, um, under and over nutrition, the comparison between Gambia and South Africa, and then the other risk factors I'm going to pass over to Celia because I know she's going to discuss all of this in, in more detail. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you very much, Dr. Celia. Okay. Um, you thank you for very, that. You've given two brilliant, inspiring, and insightful and insightful lectures. Very, That's very right. interesting. We've enjoyed every bit of it, and uh, I'm sure the audience and participants are ready. To, with their questions. It's, I've, I've really enjoyed myself and I've but noted perhaps, a few points. Yes. But perhaps, okay. before, the, perhaps before the questions, might I just give a little bit, uh, I just wanted to wrap up the two talks, if that's all right. Um, just got about another 10 minutes uh, to yes. present, if I may. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. And, and thank you, Kate, for setting out the complexity of all of that research. Um, what I've done is the simple bit. I've, I've mapped it. Uh, so in green, you can see um, the different studies that Kate referred to um, mapped to this sort of conceptual model of the life course. And what you can see is um, that the majority of the work, and, and there are other studies obviously um, ongoing, not just those that uh, Kate has mentioned, but there are, the majority of those focus on these key adolescent uh, years and the years up until the age of 40. Um, and actually, other than GAMBAS, which uh, Kate described in the Gambia, and this recent data to come from Bilkish Kasim's uh, group in KwaZulu-Natal, there has been a relative um, lack of focus on older populations. And uh, we feel that there is quite an, uh, an important need to investigate musculoskeletal aging, including fractures uh, across the region. And hence, we put together uh, the proposal for the Fractures E3 study um, across the Gambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. And I just wanted to describe that to you. Um, so Kate introduced um, this, the beginning of this slide. So. Um, the study is called Fractures E3, and that's because there are three E's for epidemiology, economic impact, and ethnography. So the context behind this, as we've sort of we've explained in the last uh, um, half hour or so, is this this rapidly aging population, high HIV prevalence in some regions, increasing multimorbidity, under and over nutrition, so within the same individual over their life course or within the same family at a point in time, together with high trauma rates across Africa and then chronically under-resourced healthcare services and medical pluralism, particularly um, in the West African context. And if we look at the IOF FRAX map from four years ago, um, none of the countries in, in the region were shaded because there wasn't sufficient incidence data with which to calibrate the FRAX tool. That's changed now because of that one study um, from South Africa, because good quality incidence data allowed in October uh, the FRAX tool to be calibrated for South Africa, which is a really uh, great achievement. And I, I hope that that um, can uh, help roll out more um, osteoporosis medications to individuals who don't necessarily have access to a DEXA scan. So our study um, 
is going to focus on hip and vertebral fractures. Hip because they are um, pretty devastating, they're expensive for healthcare services, they cost a lot of pain, and um, as we've shown in South Africa, they have a one-year 33% mortality, which is arguably um, worse than a lot of cancers. And then we're also focusing on vertebral fractures because they're common and they're really a hallmark of further fractures to come. And our outcomes that we're interested in relate to pain, disability, quality of life and death, and then demands on healthcare services and healthcare costs. Now, we've constructed um, a five-year program of work with five work packages across our three countries, South Africa, Zimbabwe and the Gambia. I'll introduce the PIs in those three countries in the next slide. In this slide, I'm going to just talk through those five work packages so that you um, know what we're, what we're up to. Um, with oversight over the whole um, of, of the study is Matt Costa. He's our orthopedic lead. Many of you will know him. He's based at Oxford. Um, and then in work package one, uh, led by Kate, uh, we're going to determine the prevalence of vertebral fractures. Now, this is a study uh, of over 5,000 individuals across the three countries, uh, sampled using GIS mapping uh, to in, with enumerated population um, from which we will sample so that we can determine age-specific prevalence um, with our primary outcome being vertebral fracture, but we're also interested in other musculoskeletal morbidities, including osteoarthritis, sarcopenia, and, um, and other wider multimorbidities. And we will assess risk factors for fracture in that work package. Then in work package two, uh, we aim to quantify the incidence of hip fractures, similarly to that which Bilkish um, and colleagues um, have published earlier this year in South Africa. Um, we'll do this work in Zimbabwe and the Gambia, and we'll determine incidence and risk factors for incident hip fracture. Um, and then we'll also look at how all of those fractures are managed um, and determine the outcomes over the course of one year. So things like return to um, functional mobility, health-related quality of life, and death. And then linking to work package two is work package three, led by my colleague Sean Noble in Bristol, who's a health economist. And we will cost um, that year post hip fracture so that we can determine the direct health costs and some of the out-of-pocket costs that patients experience because of that hip fracture. And we will then be able to use those data to model future fracture burdens um, for these countries, as well as the potential costs likely to be attributable to those future fracture burdens over the next 10, 20 and 30 years. In work package four, uh, we will run a hip fracture service survey. So we will take the WHO SARA tool, if you're familiar with that, and adapt it for uh, fracture services. And that will enable us to qu uh, quantify hip fracture services in terms of availability, so facilities, uh, staffing, equipment, and readiness to provide hip fracture care. For example, operative care versus uh, six weeks in traction. And then in work package five, uh, we will conduct a, an ethnographic study. So this will be led by my colleague, uh, Rachel Goodman Hill in Bristol. It will be done in, in urban and rural settings in all three countries, where we will um, spend time interviewing healthcare professionals, patients, and in West Africa, traditional bone setters, to understand how patients access fracture care pathways, how they um, move through those pathways, what the barriers are to that process, and what facilitates um, that process so that we can understand what influences access to health services. Um, and I wanted to introduce our three uh, in-country leads um, on which it all sort of hinges. So the first is Bilkish Kasim, who's um, a professor of gerontology and head of the Department of Geriatrics at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, so she's uh, the PI for the South African work, and she's also the senior author on Sat Nadella's paper that was published um, in, re in regard to that incidence data that we've already spoken about. And then um, Rashida Faran is a professor of international health at the BRTI, the Biomedical Research and Training Institute in Harare in Zimbabwe. She also has an affiliation at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. And um, she's an HIV specialist, and it's that particular um, angle uh, that she brings to the team, as well as um, 20 years of, of research in Zimbabwe.
And then uh, Landing Jarju is uh, the head of the calcium, vitamin D and bone health um, work at the MRC unit in the Gambia. He has many um, decades of experience working both at the coast and inland at the DSS in, in, um, in the Gambia. Um, so he's, he's the, uh, the lead within the Gambia for the work that we're going to be doing. So what do we hope to achieve with all of this? Um, this is my penultimate slide. Um, so we obviously want to calibrate fracs. Um, uh, the, it, it's brilliant that South Africa now has a tool. Um, by proxy, we have been able to calibrate, um, working with John Canis and Eugene McCluskey and colleagues, um, a proxy tool for Zimbabwe, which we would like to refine with um, quantified incidents in Zimbabwe and then obviously a new tool in um, the Gambia which would hopefully be helpful by proxy to other countries in West Africa. We'd like to develop fracture registries for use um, across the region and uh, we have seen in the UK uh, the benefit that the National Hip Fracture Database brings in terms of routine collected data providing audit and um, between hospital comparison to drive uh, improvements in quality of service and that led to the Fragility Fracture Network wanting to roll out and, and many programs now rolled out around the world um, to routinely capture data around hip fracture care. Um, and we intend to um, develop similar tools that can be used in the region. We would like to provide evidence to, to make a case to the WHO to include osteoporosis treatments um, as essential medicines. There are currently no osteoporosis treatments considered essential by the WHO. We think that is an oversight. They are um, affordable at uh, sort of 12 USD per year, thinking about oral alendronate, and comparable to other medicines in terms of costs that are currently um, on the essential medicines list. So that is one of the, um, the uh, issues that we would like to tackle with the evidence that we're able to generate. Um, we would obviously uh, like to build multidisciplinary research capacity. That's very much the aim of Samson, um, which I presented in the first part of this talk, and, and Fractures E3 um, will very much complement the aims of Samson, and the teams will clearly work um, closely together. And then finally, we want to understand um, ultimately current health, um, sorry, cu current, current fracture service provision. Um, and then current and projected musculoskeletal burdens in order to inform planning of future healthcare service provision across these three regions. So just to conclude in terms of the, uh, the known unknowns, um, we've talked about the fact that these, uh, about the, the marked changes we're going to see in terms of population aging. Um, and the fact that that is going to be occurring in countries which we think um, have this propensity to att for attenuated functional um, capacity achievement and therefore may be more prone to disability and fracture uh, as a consequence of um, lack of musculoskeletal functional attainment through the life course. We've explained that um, until very recently FRAX uh, was a bit blank um, within the region but fortunately uh, with, the, with the new data from South Africa that is beginning to be addressed. And um, we, so both Kate and I are obviously part of Fractures E3, which started just on the 1st of October. So it's got five years to run. Um, and we hope that we will be able to answer within the team um, many of the known unknowns, as well as some unknown unknowns that are yet to be known. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you. And my last slide is really the acknowledgements to uh, all of the, the teams in um, our four main countries where we're doing this work. As you might imagine, there are a lot of people involved in a program like this. Um, and I'd like to thank the Wellcome Trust for funding our collaborator award um, for a substantial amount of money over those five years to make this possible. And with that, I'd like to finish. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both uh, Dr. Kate Ward and Dr. Celia Gregson for your excellent talk and for reminding us that uh, fragility fracture is important also in Africa. I think sometimes, yes, we have the tendency to forget about this fact. And now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Agnese if she would like to uh, lead the Q&A session.
Dr. Agnese, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, okay. perfect. Perfect, okay. we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Cage and Dr. Celia. You've done very well. It's been very brilliant. You've done a very good job. We have one question here and uh, it says, fluorosis, oh dear. Okay, knowing that people's primary health related concerns in African countries may differ from people in developed countries due to the quality of health environment and healthcare provision. Do you work for raising African people's awareness as well as local national healthcare providers so that musculoskeletal diseases should be considered as important diseases even in those countries? If yes, how do you approach for policy? That's an excellent question. Celia, do you want to start? We... And then um, there is a second one. Okay. There's a second one on fluorosis. Uh -huh. Says fluorosis is a major problem throughout the uh, Rift Valley from Ethiopia to South Africa. It causes skeletal symptoms that impair bone, um, that impair bone. Has this been considered in your studies of bone? Shall I tackle the first one, Kate? And do you want to do the fluorosis one? Oh, yes, I'll yeah? give it okay. a go. Yeah. So, the, so the first question uh, was quite a long question, but if I'm right, it's about um, raising awareness, public awareness around musculoskeletal disease. Um, how does one tackle that uh, in health, current healthcare resource um, and with the setting? And then how does one translate that to policy? So, um, I mean, maybe to answer that, I might describe what we're doing in another study, which we didn't actually mention today um, in South Africa and Zimbabwe uh, around the menopause. Um, so we're running a study, we've just finished recruiting actually last week um, in Zimbabwe. So older women are um, not, often or not so often studied and their health um, priorities aren't necessarily perceived as a priority more widely. Um, and so we were keen to do a bit of work around that. And um, that has been very well received by women. It's a, it's a mixed method study, so quantitative and qualitative work. And coming out of the qualitative work, we have identified a real desire for knowledge um, around menopause. It's um, even within healthcare workers who we interviewed as well as, um, as, well as uh, participants, so people in the community. Um, and so we're currently working actually to develop some information resources um, and then we will have sort of dissemination events where those who participated can come and bring their family and friends and we can we can um, provide information, answer questions, provide infographics if uh, low literacy is, is an issue um, and to try and sort of disseminate information. But we've also, uh, in order to make that sort of sustainable, um, we, we've had a chat with, so for example, the South African Menopause Society who are keen to work with us so that those um, resources that we are able to create um, are able to be sustained by um, their their backing and they obviously have a website and infrastructure and so on. In terms of um, how we translate that to policy change, um, I think it's important to engage ministries and um, some, I mean, we're fortunate with the collaborators who we work with who are well connected. Um, and so we do have um, uh, ears who, who can potentially listen to the voice when we speak about the research findings that we will generate um, and but I think that clearly um, there's quite a lot of work to do in terms of translating research to policy. Um, in terms of fractures E3 and translating that to policy I mean that 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 is going to be as what we need to do in about four or five years time um, so we have got time to think about that. We are doing some stakeholder mapping already um, and I think um, making ensuring that stakeholders are engaged from the beginning of a research project is actually quite important so that you can listen to their priorities and adapt your research to ensure that uh, you're fulfilling the priorities of those stakeholders from the outset so that when you then have your uh, findings they um they they fit everybody's agenda thank you very much We've got a couple of questions, but 
I think um, we can take just one more. Shall I just briefly answer the fluorosis question? I think okay. the, that, that questioner made okay. a, a very a very good okay. and pertinent point. point. Yeah. Um, we aren't looking at um, dental signs of fluorosis in our study. Um, we are, um, and the imaging, we, I think we would need radiographs and we'll, we will be getting radiographs in South Africa. So it's not something that we've directly addressed in the research questions for Fractures E3. Um, nor in the nor in the Gambian studies that we've done already, um, but I do take your point, and I think it's it's another another point that that points to context specific, and taking taking into account in our different countries and our different partner countries, we've got common aims, but we do need to consider all of the risk factors that might be um, individual to I think it's the Rift Valley and South Africa and maybe Zimbabwe compared to the Gambia. So um, certainly it's something we can consider in the future. A good question. Thank you very much, participants. Thank you very much, brilliant speakers. Thank you very much, everybody, for being part of this program. I think we are really, we've really spent most of our time, and uh, we'll be cut off in a few minutes. In a, uh, we are done. But, um, we'll take on questions and answer them quietly at other times. Thank you very much for being part of this uh, seminar uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So, appreciate your presence. so on behalf of IOF, I would like to thank uh, to thank you very much for your participation in this webinar, and we hope that you enjoyed this session. Uh, we will post the recording of this webinar on the IOF website, and you will also receive the link by email tomorrow. Uh, you will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar and we would appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. If you have any questions, comments, do not hesitate to contact us at the email address webinar at iofbornhealth.org. And, um, and um, then I would like to thank again, Dr. Ngeze for, for sharing this webinar. Professor Kate Ward and Dr. Celia Gregson for their outstanding lectures and all the participants for many questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to ask all the questions. We are running out of time, uh, but uh, we really appreciate uh, your input uh, on this webinar. Uh, goodbye to everybody and uh, have a nice day or a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>